usual, this session is being recorded live to our Hangouts account, BCG account. And uh, it will be forward link to the channel list. So you can uh, rewatch it uh, over and over again. <laughs> We should like to make a, just a brief presentation while we wait for the to the brief notes. No. Yeah, because there are not many things to tell, and if I tell, then you will feel repetition. Yes. <laughs> yes. What I'm going to tell is very basic thing, so. But let me ask that how many of you know about graphs or like what kind of graphs or what you have heard of graphs so that I can keep it very simple or complicated or the presentation. I've heard about graphs. Yeah. But more than that, you know what is a graph. Okay. Okay. And its relation with the architecture or the architecture design. I'm not an Even I'm not an expert, but just to to know that. Oh, okay. Yes, Professor Dwarf told me about that theory. I have I still have to read about it, but yeah, he told that they they use a lot of graph theory. Yeah, so maybe after presentation we can discuss that how two things are related or how this work is in particular related to that. Maybe we can start. Yeah, because initially they are only definitions, and if someone can can come later, so they can join afterwards. Also, it's not complicated. Should we start? Okay, so I divided this presentation into two parts. One part is general terminology about graphs and how graph theory is relevant to architectural design. The second part is more concerned with my work that what I have done till far and what I am planning to do. So we start with very basic definitions of graph theory, which are very, very common to architecture. So the graph. So in standard notations, we denote a graph with G, V, and E, where V stands for vertices, and E stands for edges, and G is a graph. So vertices are normally the dots, and you connect two dots to draw an edge and you say that these two vertices are adjacent so if we say the name v1 and v2 so v1 and v2 are adjacent and if it is v3 so v1 and v3 are not adjacent so this is very very basic thing that the graph is so it is vertices edges and then this thing then The other thing is the directed graph, because in this case, you can say that V1 is adjacent to V2, but at the same time, V2 is adjacent to V1. But if you give some direction, then you can say that V1 is adjacent to V2, but V2 is not adjacent to V1. And the third is the multiple edges, because there can be more than one edge between two. 
so this thing and this thing so you can say that they are v1 between v1 and v2 there are three edges so if we see architecturally we are not interested mainly in directed edges initially because if we say that two room are adjacent it means that we suppose that there is a door between them so if you can go from one room to other obviously you can come back from that room to this room so therefore we are not concerned with the the directed edges same is that we are not concerned with the multiple edges because normally if two rooms are connected or adjacent then there is only one way to go and one way to come out they are not like three four day, uh, doors and all that so that's why what we are concerned is that there should not be any directed edges and there should not be any multiple edges so we call it if you see the standard terminology these graphs are called simple undirected graphs so we always concerned in architectural design with the simple undirected graphs the other thing is so now if i am talking about graphs it means that i am talking about simple undirected graphs only we are not talking about directed graphs and the multiple edges the next thing is the connected graphs so if we see this graph and if i draw one more edge or maybe i can so if you see the whole graph together then this graph is not connected because from here you cannot reach to the vertices of this part so we say that a graph is connected if from every vertex of the graph we can reach to the every other vertex of the graph or there is a path between each pair of the vertices so again in architectural design we usually consider the connected graph we don't uh, work with the disconnected graphs the next is a tree or a cycle so in a graph every closed path is called a cycle for example it's yeah it's not working So for example, if I draw some graph like this. So this is a cycle of length four because there are four edges and we start from here and we can end up here. So it's a closed path. Similarly, it is a cycle of length three because again, it is closed and there there is no cycle. So cycle is a closed path. And if a graph doesn't have any cycle, we call it a tree so for example something like this so this is a tree because it doesn't have any cycle the next thing which is which is very commonly used in the papers related to the graph theory and architecture is adjacency matrix so suppose we have a graph something like this so a b c and d so corresponding to this matrix corresponding to this graph we can construct a matrix where we have the number of rows equal to the number of vertices so the same a b c d and here also same a b c d and we say that we see each pair of the vertices so we say that a is not adjacent to a so we put 0 a is adjacent to b so we put 1 a is not adjacent to c so we put 0 and a is not adjacent to d so we put 0 something like this so we can construct an adjacency matrix if you see directly then you see that there is it's not very interesting or important matrix but to study about the graphs and more importantly if you are dealing with the graphs and if you have to give the if you have to write a computer program then you cannot give input as this graph it is very complicated but you can always give input in the form of a matrix so in that case this matrix is very important 
the next is the weighted graphs because here we are saying that if they are adjacent then we put the number 1 otherwise 0 but you can all you can also give weights to the graph for example 8 6 10 and 9 this weight can represent anything for example in architecture it can represent the distance between rooms so between c and d the distance is 10 between b and c the distance is 8 and something like this so you can always associate the weights with the graph and then according to that you can obtain a weighted adjacency matrix one of the most important concept of the graph theory which is used in architectural design is planar graphs so it means that we can if we can manage to draw a graph without edge crossing on a plane we call it a planar graph for example if we see the first figure so there is a two edges are crossing at a point but the same graph can be drawn without edge crossing if you see the second graph they both are same there is no difference if you see the relation between they both have the five vertices they have the same connections between edges the only thing is that the way they are drawn so in the first case there is an edge crossing but in the second case there is no edge crossing so if we have given a graph and if we manage to draw it on a plane without edge crossing then we call it a planar graph otherwise it's a non planar graph now if you see the design or the floor plan of any building and single story not the multi story but the single story the graph would always be planar because the floor plan is always planar they don't cross each other so that's why while considering the graphs or while considering the adjacency relation we always need simple undirected connected planar graphs so we start with simple undirected connected planar graphs like the last graph we call it a complete graph k5 you can try the way you want but it is non planar you won't be managed to draw it or you won't be managed to draw it without any edge crossing so some graphs are planar some are non planar so if like okay we'll talk about it. so this is what i am talking about simple undirected connected planar graphs this is how we define the adjacency between rooms because in vertices it's very simple if there is an edge between two vertices we say that they are adjacent but in case of rooms we say that two rooms are adjacent if they share a part of the wall or if they share a complete wall if they touch at a point then we don't say that they are adjacent and similarly here they are disconnected so adjacency means we are we are taking into account that that at least some part of the wall should be shared so that we can insert a door between the two rooms so this is how we prefer to define adjacency between rooms so initially the architectural meaning of the graph so the first important point is that if you want to give the adjacency relations between rooms like if there is a user or an architect who wants some requirement that okay i need five rooms and i want room one should be adjacent to room three three to five two to four then how to present it so the simplest way to represent that adjacency requirement is through graph so if you have to give the input the best way is to give through the graph and once you have the floor plan then again to understand the different connections between the rooms you can draw a graph for that floor plan or corresponding to that floor plan so that you can understand that what is the flow 
of the circulations in the building and how they are connected and what is the distance between these two rooms so somehow they are connected both the ways so initially the input also through input you can get a floor plan and for the floor plan you can obtain a graph which you can study to understand the different relation between the rooms also it gives you an idea of the positions of the doors positions of the windows circulation path and many more properties so we will discuss them in detail so if we look at the problem of the floor plan design normally we have the topological constraints which are concerned with the adjacency relations between the rooms the dimensional constraints so the area of the room the area of the floor plan and these kind of the things and then you can add as many as you want different constraints like the daylight or view and so if you see the architecture problem it is a multi constraint problem so in this presentation we are only concerned with the topological constraints so this is kind of a standard format of a of a problem which is given by an architect or by a user so he says that we have the five rooms so we have this graph a b c d and e so this graph represents the adjacency relations between the room so the idea is to that he want a floor plan which should satisfy these requirements this is the simple most simple problem so if we see that on the left hand side we have this graph and corresponding to this graph we have two different floor plans and you can see that both the floor plans are satisfying this these adjacency requirements and then corresponding to these floor plans again we can draw a graph so if you see this problem it doesn't look complicated if someone asks for okay i have these five rooms i want this adjacency relation and can you draw a floor plan for me so obviously you take a pen and paper and you start drawing something and at the end of the day you may have some some solution or some floor plan but let's see this problem in a bigger format suppose there are 100 rooms so what you do you cannot spend the whole day drawing and drawing and then keep checking it and then you know asking others that is it the feasible solution or not so the first thing is that the feasibility of the constraint if i give you a graph how come you know that there exists a floor plan for it or not maybe the graph which i am asking is already over constraint and it is not possible to to have a floor plan for it and we spend maybe one month to keep looking for the floor plan at the end of the day there is no floor plan so this is like typically a mathematical problem that that the if there is a graph so does there exist a floor plan corresponding to it so to check the feasibility of the constraint now if the same thing that if we have given the graph so does a floor plan exist corresponding to it or not so we need to give some mathematical theorems or some mathematical results which says that yes if input is this then there exists a floor plan corresponding to it otherwise not the other more complicated thing is that if somehow we have this feasibility constraint that we know that okay the the constraints are feasible then you need to design or you need to propose an algorithm which take the graph and then which construct the floor plan corresponding to it and even if we make the problem more complicated then we can ask for the shape of the floor plan because you have a graph which is planar graph but i can say that i want a floor plan rectangular or i want a floor plan plus shape or i want a floor plan l shape so first thing is that you need to check that the constraint which they have given is are feasible or not if they are feasible then you need to construct a floor plan corresponding to it into the required shape and if you have to do this automatically then you have to propose an algorithm which take the input and propose the 
required output so if you see in that way the problem is very very complicated and if the number is big like 1000 or if you have to generalize the results then it is very very complicated and the last thing which many people are work over is that you have given a graph then which shape best fit the the constraint like for a given graph someone can say that rectangular is the best option for it and maybe rectangular is not satisfying this constraint so maybe l shape is best or maybe a plus shape is best or maybe some other shape is best so to look for the the shape which perfectly or which best or which is the optimal solution for the given constraint and if i'm telling a lot of problems related to this and if the graph is over constraint then again we may need to propose an algorithm which says that okay here are the 20 rooms 45 edges but if we delete these three edges then graph won't be over constraint and then you can have a solution for it so again we need to develop an algorithm or we need to propose an optimal solution which says that yeah the minimum number of the edges which we need to delete after that the graph or the solution is feasible the about, uh, yeah rooms in a standard way we take rectangulars yeah because because in architecture initially we start with the rectangular but you know that's the best part of the rectangles you start with the rectangular and suppose you don't want this edge so you can say that okay now this is not rectangular so but you start with the rectangular and then at the end you can make the other changes to have the orthogonal shapes but yeah uh, the problem which we are talking about that is that uh, we are considering the rooms rectangular but the the floor plans are not rectangular any other questions still now <coughs> now is still the problem is not very very complicated if you want to make it more complicated then you can add some more constraints for example you can include the exterior till now i have drawn something the graph like this but then you can say that i want these two rooms connected to north i want uh, this one in east i want this one in west and i want these three in south so you can increase more constraint and after increasing this constraint the problem gets more complicated and to look for a floor plan which satisfy these constraints one more constraint which you can add architecturally is negative adjacency here we are giving the the requirements in terms of the adjacency but i can give somewhere the negative weights suppose here so i say that i want a floor plan with other adjacency but b should not be connected to c so you can introduce the negative adjacency or you can add the weights like 10 and 9 so you say that this is my first priority that a and d should be connected so i'm putting more weight on that c and should c and d if they are connected well and good not then well and good but this is like the priorities so you can make it more complicated and you can discover many other ways to consider the architectural inputs so by considering the different ways you can have many more architectural inputs and then you can propose the the more precise solution which satisfy more or less the architectural constraints one more thing which you can propose is non planar graphs so if we talk about the planar graphs they are considered or uh, we can look them for a single story houses but if there is a multi-story building then you can talk of the non planar graph so you have to pick the planar graph draw the first floor then you need to look for an edge kind of a stairs which is going to the second floor and then you can draw the second floor and something like this so it's very very complicated but yes this is one more 
constraint which we can introduce in this kind of the problem any other suggestions we can discuss after the presentation so now what i have talked about is that we have given a graph and the idea is to generate or to construct a floor plan corresponding to that graph so in the literature a lot of work has been done only in case of the rectangles which means that if you have given a graph and does there exist a rectangular floor plan corresponding to it and if yes then there exists some algorithm to construct the rectangular floor plan but there doesn't exist other kind of the work which talks about the orthogonal floor plans or the other shape floor plans but in this particular case so that's why we call it rectangular dual or rectangular dual graphs so you can see here that we have given an adjacency graph with five vertices corresponding to this adjacency graph we look for a rectangular floor plan now for this rectangular floor plan one is that we can draw a graph corresponding to it which is most of the cases similar to the given adjacency graph we call it weak dual graph and the other thing what we can do is that we can draw a graph corresponding to it while considering the exterior so here we have considered the exterior north south east west and if you consider the exterior you can construct a graph which we call it a dual graph the interesting property of this dual graph is that that you can again construct the floor plan from this dual graph which you can see that is in red so you construct a floor plan you construct a dual graph corresponding to the floor plan then you represent each of the region with vertices suppose this region i put a vertex then this is the region means you know the closed boundary and these two regions have a edge in common so i connect them so if i do that then i can again generate the required floor plan from the dual graph so adjacency graph floor plan dual graph and from dual graph i can again go back to the rectangular floor plan so if you if you see the papers in the literature there is a lot of work corresponding to this problem where you are just looking for the rectangular floor plan for other shapes and for other the many problems are still open so if you want to start reading some work related to this work especially the rectangular floor plan i suggest this is the paper enumerating architectural arrangements by generating their underlying graphs so in this if you see at this paper so they have considered this kind of the problem like for example we have given this graph and the problem is to construct automatically a floor plan corresponding to this graph so they have considered a dual graph and then they propose some algorithm some techniques and using that techniques you can have the floor plan corresponding to it and if you read this paper then through this paper you can find many more work which is related to this problem so this problem of generating a floor plan or a rectangular floor plan corresponding to the given graph is called a rectangle dualization problem so for this problem it has applications in electrical engineering also so a lot of work has been done so there already exists some necessary and sufficient conditions mathematical conditions for the existence of rectangular floor plan so using that conditions you can say that for this graph a floor plan exists or for this graph it doesn't there also uh, exists some algorithm corresponding to this problem but the interesting thing which you can note about this is that the rectangle dual is not unique 
so the topological arrangement of the rooms is not unique if you consider the graph on the left hand side this is one graph but you can see that there are two floor plans both are corresponding to this graph and they both satisfy the the adjacency requirements set up by the given graph so again this is a problem that if you have given a graph how many floor plan exist corresponding to that graph and then which one is optimal or which one is better and then you can go into the deep so these are the the works which which are corresponding to the rectangle dual graphs one more interesting graph is outer planar graphs so if you look for a planar drawing of any graph let's consider the graph which i have drawn there so if you look for the the planar drawing of any graph then it is always divided into the regions so we call them regions so that one region is this the other region is this the third region is this and then there is a exterior region so you can always divide the graph into the the planar graph into the regions now if all the vertices of the graph belongs to the exterior region like here the vertices are v1 v2 v3 v4 v5 so all five vertices belongs to the exterior region then we call it a outer planar graph this graph is very very interesting in in architectural design because it guarantee the existence of windows to each of the room because each of the vertex is connected to the exterior it means that if you draw a floor plan corresponding to it then each of the room will have the windows so for example this and if you construct a floor plan so you can see that all the rooms are connected to the exterior and therefore all of them has a window so if you introduce this constraint that i want a house or the the floor plan sorry windows, openings. openings yes yeah i am saying windows because related to this outer plan graph this is a paper which called windows and floor plans so there they talk about this concept outer plan graph so this is the one more interesting paper related to the same graph theoretical concept is the generation of floor plans with circulation spaces so in this they they proposed an algorithm where you can draw a floor plan with spanning circulation spaces so that the circulation space is connected to to each of the room and they are connected to each other so this is also totally depend on this graph theoretical concept so now the connectivity of the floor plan suppose we have two floor plans then on what basis we can say that one is more connected one is less connected so we need to define some criteria and there exists many ways to compare so one way to compare the two floor plan or the connectivity of two floor plan is by comparing the number of edges in their adjacency graph suppose here we have the two floor plans So you draw the graph corresponding to both the floor plans then you count the number of edges so here it's 15 here it's 11 so you say that this one is more connected than this one so if we talk about the rectangular floor plans only then a rectangular floor plan or the adjacency graph of a rectangular floor plan can have at most 3n minus 7 edges where n is the number of the rooms 
so which means that we can say that a floor plan a rectangular floor plan is best connected if its adjacency graph has 3 and minus 7 edges so recently i am working on the concept of the generic rectangular floor plan so the idea because the problem is that you have a graph and you need to construct a rectangular floor plan corresponding to it so you always need to check the existence of the rectangular floor plan and then you have to construct it so what i am thinking is that i can propose a rectangular floor plan and it guarantees that that it always going to satisfy the constraint provided by the user so if we manage to do that then we don't have to check every time and we can say that use this rectangular floor plan which is generic it guarantee that it satisfy the constraint whatever constraint you gives and if it is not satisfying the constraint it means that there doesn't exist a rectangular floor plan corresponding to it so the work is in in process and very soon i have the results so i will share the paper with you so coffee break <laughs> because i think till now it's very hectic or mathematical presentation maybe and if any question because now i am going to talk more about more precisely about my work what i have done till far and this was the general presentation so if you have some questions related to the general presentation please ask otherwise we move forward or if you want to take coffee go ahead yes oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> if you consider uh, as an evaluation, because it can be considered for the architectural floor plans, simple and directed connected planner drives. But for instance, in the case of, a, of an airport or a very complex floor plan where we have uh, specific uh, uh, ways of communication, for instance, exit uh, fire ex is, doesn't need to be very complex, but fire, fire ex escape exits. You can only go in one way. Yeah. So, is it possible to integrate this analysis directed graphs? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That that's the beauty of the graph. You can add so many constraints like this for the particular purpose. Like I talked only about the house or the buildings where we don't need the directed graphs or where we don't need the weighted graphs. But we can introduce. That's why there are so many different kind of the graphs, and you can use some properties to 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 design. So for the particular purpose, yes, you can use the particular graphs. In mathematics, what we normally do is that the idea is to give a general theory so that anyone can use it. You know, if you have the general theory that, okay, this is the condition or this is already a inbuilt software which you can put the, the input and it can say that, like for the planar graphs, there are some already existing algorithms. If you draw the graph and you click the button, it will say that it is planar or not because they have developed the journal theory now you draw the graph and you can check so yeah my work is more concerned with developing the journal theory uh, what kind of uh, now what kind of quality it has uh, each hedge what kind of architectural quality has each hedge on the, those graphs architecture it's a door it's a wall it's a window it's a yeah normally if we say that the two rooms are adjacent it means that there is a wall between them because if there is a wall between them you can always insert a door between them yes yes it can be adjacent but don't have a door you don't so yes this will leave yeah i think this will leave to the architects once we have a compositional schema then you know architects can always modify it they can see it and okay let's remove this door we don't need it let's put it here something like this so this is like the last stage thing which which architects can do but initially the the main thing is to check the feasibility that there exists something like this or not you can say that okay i want this room to be connected to all 10 rooms and then i can say that there doesn't exist any floor plan for this constraint so remove something or otherwise there won't be any solution and if you do this through computer then it increases the usability anyone can 
check it anyone can use it so if you develop a theory and from theory there comes the algorithm and from algorithm there comes the users the main goal is to get the optimum solutions in terms of productivity the main goal is to satisfy the user's requirement you asked me that i need these connections which we call adjacency and i give you the graph you give me the graph or you can directly say that ah this i need this connection so i can draw the graph for it and i need to propose a floor plan satisfying this connection so one thing that happened that if there is some theory i can say that no there doesn't exist any floor plan because what you are asking is too much so just remove something or i can propose just remove these two three things then it is possible then you can ask that no i don't want the rectangular floor plan but let's say the other shape so then again there comes the problem that okay this shape is possible but this is not possible so these kind of the things and what happens if i give you an uh, under constraint graph so i think now oh, i need this and that but the rest i, I, I there is nothing like under constraint graph yeah I, i can say that there exists a solution for it or there doesn't exist a solution for it so there are only two cases why there doesn't exist because over constraint it cannot be under constraint mm -hmm. Now, what, what I was thinking is, in terms of architect, of an architect or a client saying, "Oh, so I want a big room, a big living room with a kitchen, but uh, then I, I want the, the rooms to be far away, but without specifying, without specifying everything, you know." Yeah, then maybe the graph is disconnected or something like oh, this, okay, but okay. but it doesn't have some properties. Maybe we introduce the connections that you. Think that might be possible. In that yeah. case, maybe you need to create constraints in order to make it feasible. Yeah, but that, yeah, the yeah, the idea, yeah, the idea is to develop this prototype because it's like everyone cannot reach to the architect. But if there is some this very simple kind of the prototype where he knows that okay, let's give this ten rooms. I want ten rooms, and I want these connections. So he can enter the connections, and then there are some floor plans. No, but like in India, I think eighty to eighty-five percent people don't go to the architects, and the population is one point two billion. So you can say that one billion people don't consult the architects. I am not helping them, but I am giving you the problem. Should this audience then know something about topology? This audience? This audience, yes. I don't know. <laughs> they should know. They should know something about the topology of graphs. No, not that much. <laughs> I think not that much. But it's always a plus. <laughs> yes, it's always a plus to understand the solution to. because here i am not talking that how to construct the floor plans how to develop the compositional schemas and this and this i am just introducing you to the problem if i talk about this construction and the compositional schema then yes we talk about the topology also but i am just talking that this is one of the research topic and there are many many problems which are open in this field uh, but depending on so the graph is a general way of drawing the brain For the future, yes. Floor plan. Yes. Is that a way? But I think yes to introduce different things. That now the brief is simply about connection between rooms. Yes. And maybe the orientation, but to de to develop the true floor plan from the brief, for example, it's important to introduce regulation and normative con constraints. That is to say, minimal dimension for uh, the rooms or a connection of. Some rooms with light, and some rooms can also not have this connection to the light. So all of those kind of information should be introduced in the graph, or are constraints that happen. You know, the the beauty of rectangle is this: it, it doesn't work with the sphere or with others. If you consider like these spheres, and if you try to develop some composition schema, they have a lot of gaps and everything, a lot of problems. But with rectangles. if you have some composition schema then somehow you can introduce the dimensions and the other things because the rectangles are very flexible they only go this and they only go this 
so if you go this the other one shrinks or if you want this or this so if you have the composition schema for that which in the next part we'll see that the, the floor plan satisfying the dimensional constraint and some other constraint yes it's a step by step thing so once first you satisfy the topological the connection thing then the dimensional constraints and then one by one like the window and this thing and this thing so that's what i'm saying what i'm talking about is very general work which is like for to reach to the larger audience if you want the very particular thing obviously there are so many architects and you can help them <laughs> Compared to grass, what are the common uh, criteria? In what sense? For example, no. But when I imagine two two spaces, you to draw grass out of them, I would compare them visually. Is no, there... to compare them, the first thing which you need is that they should have the same number of the vertices, like the floor plan. Sorry. To be comparable. Hey, to be comparable. And then there are many problems. Like one more problem is this: if there is one graph, and then you look for the distance between each pair of the vertices, like v1 and v4, the distance is two. Then here the distance is one, and you draw one more graph, and you can find the sum of the minimum distance because architecturally it's very interesting the sum of the minimum distances. So this is one thing. So it depends, like what you are looking for, and then on that basis you can compare them. I didn't read, but th there must be something like this because this is the field which even the mathematicians are exploring so much. Like it has applications in electrical engineering, in other engineering fields, and every day because this is how the graph theory evolved. It is it just for a few seconds. It is start with the seven bridge problem. There was a village, and there was seven bridges in the village. And someone asked that, "Is it possible that I pass through each of the bridge without repeating anyone?" And people start thinking about it. That is it possible? Is it not? They started going this and this and this, and they didn't find the solution. Something like this. And then there was a mathematician, Euler, E U L E R. And he drew these bridges like a graph, and through graph on panel paper he started connecting the things. And he said, "Ah, if you follow this route, then obviously you can you you can pass all the bridge without repeating it." And then comes the concept of the graph theory. So it already came with a lot of applications. It is very very applied field in mathematics, and you can find applications everywhere. Which graph? Ones. Yeah. Because it means that you can that you make a circle. <coughs> when in, in planar graphs. If you draw the graph of any floor plan, it is always planar. Oh. There should not be any edge crossing. So that's why, if graph is non-planar, it means that there doesn't exist a floor plan corresponding to it. This is very simple theory. So if you need a planar graph. Or if you consider the constant, it should be planar. Otherwise, there is no floor plan. Should we move to the next part? So, one of the related problem, well-known problems, is space allocation problem, which is computationally arrangement of room inside a polygon. So you have given some rooms. Different rooms of different sizes, in particular rectangle, and then you have given a polygon, maybe something like this, which is made up of a straight line, <laughs> and then you have to fit them inside 
this polygon so first thing is that is it possible to fit them or not if it is possible to fit them then you should have the minimum waste space or the voids or the gaps and this kind of the problem so they call it a space allocation problem now if you want to relate it with architecture so there is a kind of the matrix which was introduced i saw it in a book by kaled which is architectures new media it is a chapter space allocation so there he introduced this weighted matrix now let's talk about the complex building till now we are mainly concerned with the houses but if you see the complex building like hospitals like universities and this kind of the things it is very difficult to to give the adjacency relation by graphs you cannot say that easily that okay i want library here and then library should be close to this classroom and this and this so what he said that you take an existing model like an hospital and then you compare the number of trips between the different rooms like you have the room of the nurse then you have the room of the patient and you have the room of the doctor so you see that how many times the nurse go to the room of the patient maybe 25 times in a week or you can count per day and you can see the number of type times he is going to the room of the doctor or particular doctor so maybe 15 times so it means that the distance between the room of the nurse and patient should be close than the distance between the room of the nurse and the doctor so on this basis he introduced this kind of the weighted matrix where they count the number of trips between the between the different pair of the room so like here there are 16 rooms and then you normalize them on the scale of 10 so which means that 10 is the maximum number and 0 is the minimum it means you are not going to that room or you are going two times or maximum you are going to the 10 times so this is kind of the matrix which they construct from an existing model and then they say that using this matrix now you need to construct a floor plan which optimally satisfy this matrix so which means that the problem is to find a floor plan where the sum of the weighted distances between the room is minimum because if distance is minimum it means you can go there more often and don't have to walk that much and they are more adjacent or in other terms you have to maximize the connectivity of the floor plan which means that you need to have a floor plan which has the maximum connectivity so let's say that we have given the design briefs where we have given the topological constraints by the matrix which we have already seen then there are 15 rooms br1 br2 are bedrooms then there are two guest rooms uh, two bathrooms two wc a living room a dining room a kitchen two studies a library and a playing room and we have their width and height so each one is first one is width and the other one is height and they are the rectangles and then we have given the shape of the floor plan so the problem is to fit all these rooms which are rectangular into the shape while satisfying the topological constraints which are given in terms of the number of the trips uh, the, the, the both numbers mean width and height so we have the dimensional constraint we have the topological constraint in terms of the number of the trips and then we have given shape and this should be since a space allocation problem so it should be done computationally like through an algorithm that you take this input and then it fit it into the plus shape floor plan so now if we if you see this floor plan and since we are dealing with a complex problem where the number of rooms can be very big so what we think that we can divide it into the rectangles 
and the maximum number of the rectangles because we can divide it into the three rectangles also something like this but since the number of rooms would be big so it's good enough to divide them into the rectangles so we divided them into the five rectangles which means that we can divide the given rooms into five groups then for each group we construct a rectangular floor plan and then we adjoin the five rectangular floor plan to have the plus shape floor plan now we have given the topological constraint so on the basis of the topological constraint that means on the basis of the number of the trips we divided the given rooms into five groups and you can see that somehow on that matrix because it's kind of real matrix the group formed are very interesting so first group has two guest room one bathroom and one wc the second has living room dining room and kitchen so it means that they should be together the third group is two <coughs> offices and library the fourth group uh, wc and bathroom and the fifth group has two bedroom and playing room now for each group we construct a rectangular floor plan now earlier we have seen that normally we have given an adjacency graph and for that we construct a rectangular floor plan but in this case we don't have any adjacency graph so what we think is that let's consider the best connected floor plans because best connected floor plans have the maximum connectivity that means the floor plans with <coughs> 3 n minus 7 edges so corresponding to each group we construct a best connected floor plan and since the dimension are not in our hand so there is no guarantee that they will fit in the shape of the rectangle so we introduce this kind of the extra spaces so that the shape will remain rectangle and then we adjoin these five rectangles to have the plus shape floor plan which has some extra spaces and at the same time it automatically generates the graph of this floor plan <clears throat> so like here it has dining room kitchen and living room there are two uh, bedrooms playing room two offices library and this is now done computationally so to do this i developed a prototype where you can give the inputs n is the number of the room so you are looking for 15 rooms then there are the name of the rooms or the, their functions then you can give this weighted matrix which gives the number of the trips and then at the end you can give the width and height so you take this input and if you run this prototype <clears throat> i hope it's working so it generates a graphic user interface where it says that okay you have the 15 rooms then there are the five groups so name of the group group 1 group 2 group 3 group 4 and group 5 now since we are dividing them into the groups on the basis of the number of the trips and we are using an algorithm for it so algorithm don't understand you know the the feelings of an architect so you can say that no i am not happy with this room particular i want to change this room from one group to the other so this can be done from here so you can change here i am not changing it but you can change here then if you see the plus shape floor plan so there are five positions center then left then above then right and then below so each group can have any of the position so that's why you can choose the position for each of the group where you want maybe somewhere in the left or somewhere in there so there it can be choose from here and then for the best connected floor plan 
you can have eight different compositional schemas. So this all compositional schema generates the best connected electron for plant. So you can choose any one of the compositional schema which you see like if there are five rooms, then you can say that, okay, I want that compositional schema where fifth room heads towards north or something like this. So you can choose this compositional schema from this GUI there. Eight possibilities. And if you do this all hard work, then you have the plus shape floor plan and its graph. So we have just worked with the plus shape floor plan, but it's still the problem is open for the rectilinear floor plans so that we can consider all the orthogonal floor plans and then according to your desire we can say that okay if you want l shape then here is the l shape floor plan or the other shape floor plans or the problem is to look for the best shape which fits the given rooms and the adjacency requirement thank you very much any questions <laughs> Oh. Okay. <laughs> you said that the input was number of rooms. The One of the input. The number of trips and the area of the trip. Yes, area of the rooms. So we have types of inputs. Yes, this is what I am considering. We, then we can add inputs. This is the start. We can always keep adding the other inputs. Um, at a certain point, we will have some kind of conversation about. Um, certain principles that architects like to follow in, in, in design, like I uh, gave you the example of um, um, John Habakkuk, uh, where he gives those ideas of uh, planning thematic bands, which are occupied with certain kinds of rooms. And, uh, and that strategy actually generates a kind of an order in, in the plan, uh, while keeping positions where you can connect the, the, the okay. in a, let's say consistent way. Uh, could you adapt this strategy to this more, let's say, generic structure in a way that uh, we could also consider this kind of composition uh, uh, constraints, let's say? Yes, I think. Because I, I think that would be a, a, a Great step towards something that. Okay, if you have that text paper, okay. <laughs> think, wow, this is really uh, generating something very useful. Okay, so if that, you have that, that paper, send me step. and yeah. okay, yeah. we can discuss over it. Okay. Uh, I think there is one thing uh, lacking in this tool, which is uh, you, you, you always uh, talk about. Uh, living spaces, yes. living rooms, rooms that are uh, intentionally for a yeah. particular function. Or, yes. So, and you, you don't talk about um, transit spaces, circulation uh, spaces. Yes. Yeah. This is I am working uh, over it. It would be relatively easy to introduce. Yes. In this, uh, this yes. Uh, uh, um, circulation space is a space that must be connected with several. Yes. Rooms at all. Yes. And Perhaps it it has left some constraints in yes. area or in dimensions, width, height, dimensions. Yes, I think this would be envision. Yeah, so this is one. yeah. Because I'm about to add yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm working over it. I'm about to add kind of circulation space which is connected to most of the rooms so that you can see the path that okay from here you can go like this. So yes, I am adding this. Yeah. Yeah. In that sense, yes, yeah, I will add it. I think you should uh, distinguish between angles and doors because it's uh, yes. the idea to help us to understand the situation. Yes, we can add some the kind of. Course, yeah. This uh, situation space is one more dot with some kind of code. Yeah. Okay.
Let me show the picture not the last one, one before, but plus this one and this shape. Yeah. So somehow what's happening is that the circulation spaces are really what remains of the of the other spaces or not. So for example, in this uh, the white uh, rectangles yes. are is the remaining space yes. from, from the module let's yes. say, and then the dark gray are the remaining space yes. from higher uh, yes. levels. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if this could be the, the, the circulation spaces because of the dimensions of the Example, yes. In this case, you have very slim parts. So yes. Yes. So one idea what we are thinking of is that that initially we propose the rectangular rooms, but somehow we can convert into some kind of the orthogonal rooms so that you know there won't be any extra space. The other idea is to connect these extra space in a way that they all should be connected. So, yeah. No, so because the I imagine this is like a first iteration of yes, the... Yes, it's the very first, yes. yes. Eventually, yes, those remaining spaces could be used for circulation, but yes. maybe it needs some more um, rule, maybe one or, or another. Because... Uh, no, that's what I, I discussed with Professor Dwarth also, that what exactly we can do just after that. Still, I am waiting for his input. That yeah. because this is the initial stage, which is taking some input for a very general user. But now let's add some architectural stuff to it, and I think that is the reason I came here. Yes. Yes. So yeah, one way. Uh, to avoid these extra space is to consider some overlapping something like this yeah Developed. Yeah. Yeah, but this is the problem. Like sometimes I get stuck because I need architectural inputs. It's what I am doing is kind of computational. But if you don't add the architectural meaning, then at some point it is kind of maybe no use or it gets stuck somewhere. So that's what I am looking for. <laughs> Uh, uh, there are basically two two things that architects use every time they design a plan for any kind of building, maybe a house, maybe another type of building. But there are always two types of grids that we use. One is compositional grid, and the other is a structural grid. So all the other requirements somehow fit this concept. Um, we can talk about things that don't fit into this kind of logic, but this is, let's say, a common logic. Um, so, this would mean, you know, considering uh, the generation of, uh, of the rectangular uh, aggregations uh, based on some matrix that is uh, um, imposed to this uh, uh, generation. Uh, that would mean that uh, you should have, let's say, this, uh, the definition of this matrix somehow, and then the generation of the rectangular uh, um, uh, um, composition on top of that. There is also something which is a, let's say, a generic design process that uh, architects use when they have this matrix and put rectangles on the top of the, uh, of the matrix. Sometimes, like uh, what it happens here, for instance, to the, um, the upper rectangle where you have the, 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 
PR uh, space, uh, which leaves a lot of um, uh, white space, yes. leftover space there. Um, the architect might consider the possibility of using a different proportion because it needs a lot of space. Yes. So having also space uh, in terms of, uh, of the generation to adapt these uh, proportions uh, could also be an interesting uh, tool. But of course these are, let's say, uh, um, uh, kind of uh, fine-tuning details that maybe could just yes. be a kind of interactive yes. interface Yes. Build somehow this kind of system. And um, again, another uh, uh, another thing is um, the problems. I mean, uh, uh, an architectural design problem is a sum of uh, many different many. kinds of problems, and and the solution is typically uh, a compromise between all of them. And it's, it is holistic in the sense that it's not. Uh, a, a, a direct sum of the solutions. Okay, so let's say that the the, the way the partial solutions are organized uh, together is also a design problem. Yes. Okay. Uh, and that means uh, I would say that um, this kind of uh, organization problems, because this is uh, an essential. One part of the, of the design problem yes. is the spatial organization yes. uh, of the program um, is usually not the most difficult part of the project to solve, except in cases of very large programs and very complex programs with a lot of constraints, like let's say a hospital, yes. uh, an airport. Things like this, yes. which we can imagine immediately that uh, the large uh, program uh, generates a lot of difficulties. In that sense, um, I, I would say that uh, I, I see a lot more application um, of this kind of approach in very large programs than actually in small programs. Mm. Uh, although the two can be very uh, useful. Uh, but to make it more useful for, let's like, say, small, smaller projects, with uh, um, it has to have a lot of uh, interactivity with the other topics that uh, architects use. So I, I would say that these like, other layers, like the, the, the structural uh, uh, matrix, the compositional matrix, should be things to 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 be considered. Yes. I think uh, you know this is uh, designs of thought that is kind of you know that used to do the static things and the, the complicated guys. <laughs> but uh, of course, hospitals is a, a big example to, to be start with. But I can uh, we have an idea. Start with the uh, operating room. Operating rooms in hospitals are extremely difficult to solve. There are, there, there are many people with their ideas. They know all the things should function. function. But uh, the, at the end, we want to really know what's the, the, the best, the best solution. So I think with this kind of tool, uh, uh, without a static of things, because you know, just one, one of the work with the functions. And I think it's a good, a good, a good start to test the, the, the tool with a simple thing, with a very small thing, simple thing yeah. to see if uh, it works. Yeah. Because operating room is a kind of difficult thing. Okay. It has uh, um, different uh, uh, circulatory uh, ways to, to put the patients, the, the doctors, the, the, the things, you know, I don't know, the name, but everything should work with this uh, people. But it's not easy to do that. It's a, a, a really simple, uh, difficult thing when you uh, the design of uh, operating room. At the end, we st still uh, we are not satisfied. Okay. We, there is something that we, we saw. We think 
uh, some, someone or some, another time we should be better than we did. So, this tool, I think it's a kind of a thing, uh, good space to, to, to play with. Yes, to play with, you have to start, yes. It's fine, it's fine. If you want, I can give you some, some ideas of fraction in a waiting room. Uh, the reason why I'm talking about the making things fit is that it's too much. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, the 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 program, it's over, no? program is great. Um, but um, uh, I'm thinking about it in, in terms of uh, what is a, a constant process in, uh, in architecture. There is always some kind of larger uh, scheme that defines the composition, okay? Yeah, and, and, and that is usually something that guides the other, uh, the other parts. Um, and uh, I think there are some ways of approaching that. Um, once I developed, uh, uh, um, it, it was made in Grasshopper, although it, it was a depressing uh, I developed a uh, um, the code to, to, to define um, uh, um, an urban grid based on that famous rule subdividing rectangles and putting the street in the middle. Okay? So basically, what happened was, and I will simplify, uh, I had a large rectangle, a large urban area to design the first street, second street, fourth street, so on, like this. And the code would stop when it would reach uh, a rectangle with a certain area. So below a certain area, it would be fine. But we could have problems like that. Yeah. But we could have problems like, like having, uh, for instance, very small and long rectangles, which might be nice for. Oops, sorry. Okay. 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 Which might be nice for. Okay. Might be nice for. Uh, simply for a, a pictorial uh, composition, but to define uh, urban blocks, it doesn't make sense. At a certain point, we found out that the best way of solving this would be to define a matrix, a matrix to uh, um, uh, orthogonal matrix to um, fit all the subdivisions. So basically, we have to define, let's say, the grain of this, and we would make these um, streets fit that grain. That meant two things that were meaningful in terms of uh, an urban grid. First, we could have coincident streets, which means we could have some crossings, uh, street crossings, uh, uh, really orthogonal in the right place. That could introduce uh, some meaning into, into, the, uh, uh, into the final design. And we could also constrain the, the, the design in such a way that we could define a minimum of, uh, 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 of a certain number of uh, um, modules to, to, uh, uh, to define the subdivision. And in the end, we would have the right proportion. And, by uh, and, and we created a, a parameter that we could change, which was the size of the grain. And if we would... Um, um, change uh, uh, the, the, the size of the grain to a higher value, the number of streets uh, uh, that were uh, being generated in a coincident way uh, 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 would, uh, would be more than if the, the size of the grain would be uh, smaller. Okay? So, uh, uh, and, and was just by using this extra parameter like the size of the grain. So it's a way of generating rectangular uh, um, uh, organizations with uh, making it fit into something that makes sense, leaving some uh, 
issues of proportion reasonably open, but still uh, giving preferences, let's, let's say, regarding some, some kind of, uh, um, uh, of po possible organization. But it means that you need to define some uh, basic matrix below the whole, the whole thing. So this is simply a, a um, let's say, a, a, a suggestion in the sense that in the end you can generate uh, meaningful arrangements of rectangles, uh, but still keep something, you know, some um, bigger structure and uh, a way of organizing this big, bigger structure. So it's basically working with two layers. One is one layer of constraints where you may have one or two variables, uh, and and the other is defined by the uh, uh, by the graphs uh, uh, and the adjacency matrix. So th this is uh, just a suggestion. We can discuss it later a little bit more. As far as I understood, in your model, you try to find the overall continuity. Yes. Um, what is the, uh, I mean, uh, from, from, I think that from an architectural point of view, probably uh, it would be more interesting to look at the specific connectivity of one of the others. Are you, are you taking that into account? Am I missing it or, or not? Like in this particular case, we are taking it into account on the basis of number of trips. Because number of trips. So yes. So th th there is a kind of, uh, of evidence that the number of trips translate into yes. into connectivity. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Could you elaborate on the kind of margin to the, to the area? For example, 5% or something when you have this kind of white spaces, so they can adjust if needed. Yeah, so yeah, that's what I am working over it that how to optimize these white spaces. So, like, we can give some mathematical theory that if you use this algorithm, then the white spaces would be minimum. Yeah. So, here I haven't added it, but yeah. Because that's what we're saying, maybe structure or composition line. Yeah. And try to adjust to some to some uh, under underlying geometry or I don't know. For example, in modernism they use sixty centimeters as a mod module. But if we have some other type of module, then it yeah, then it is easier. Also, it it uh, optimizes construction uh, costs because yes. it, it makes things smaller. And uh, it can align, super align structure. Yeah. Mm. Uh, um, also, another thing that uh, maybe you could use sometimes the help of an architect, but still, I think you can do it yourself. Sometimes <laughs> looking at what has been generated, just look at it and, and, and think, what could I do better than the, the other? And when we look at that result, we immediately see a few things that could improve. Let's say that you mirror this result, okay, so that you have this space related to this empty space with that empty space. And we can see that we start aggregating all the empty spaces in a way that probably uh, we are having too, uh, we are using too much uh, space to solve uh, the whole problem. So first I just uh, mirror this thing, okay? Then let's imagine that all this is mirrored the other way, so that this connects this way, okay? And again we have connections between all these things, and we start seeing that uh, things can have, uh, can be connected. You can have a circulation inside, yeah. and still you have too much space in that circulation, okay? And things can start to improve, and we can see how they could really compact 
uh, uh, a little bit because if we have this space here and this space here, we immediately, immediately see that things can be really be more compressed. Um, so uh, the question that comes later is: Okay, we can see, <coughs> do this with uh, uh, just with a simple uh, reasoning about the, the problem? What went wrong with with the algorithm? How can mm -hmm. I improve it? Okay. Yeah. So um, what, uh, what is the problem? Uh, sometimes it's just a question of you know having some. Uh, uh, um, Algorithms that test a few solutions and, and, and try to get through some uh, um, some process, test several solutions and, and improve it could be a genetic, uh, a genetic algorithm or something like that that picks up one or two solutions because they fit uh, the matrix, but then they're using some other uh, procedures that can improve. The, the, the solution, but okay, just uh, uh, <laughs> a few topics that I think that at a certain point need, need to be addressed. Yes, I think you can still improve this using the approach that you're having until now. Uh, it can be improved, but at a certain point, it's always important to look at these things and see what is going on. There might be some some wrong assumptions. Okay. Yeah. And um, sometimes we need to get back, is the result occurring systematically? These, these things that we point out as not exactly what we wanted, uh, the result of a bad algorithm or a bad assumption. Okay? Could be both. But it, it needs to be, uh, uh, let's say, questioned. Yes. And I, I think I, I didn't become totally elucidated about the workflow you propose. So you have initially you have, uh, you have to ID uh, several rooms or spaces and uh, the connectivity constraints. Yes. Okay. And then, then that gives birth to a graph. Yes, in the algorithm, yes. Okay. Uh, but you said um, that um, this kind of arrangement of spaces rooms should give birth to a, a graph with no crossing edges, a flatter graph. Yes, yes. And how does this, this graph, because this graph here, yes, should have a, a planar uh, yeah, form, not, not, uh, it, but it this should, should be, be in the interval. Placed. Yeah, this this should be planar because well, we can. It, it appear like that? Yeah, because yeah. I haven't drawn it because it is we are doing through computer. So what I am doing is that I am giving this. I have uh, added uh, a code that two rooms are adjacent. Then you know, draw these two rooms or name them two and draw an edge between them. So while drawing them, it's because it is done through computer. So it is not considering that it has to draw it in a planar form. Systemize to show in a graphic manner the articulation of the spaces. Yeah. So in, the, in this in this form, uh, I think it doesn't serve that. Uh, that, uh, that uh, yes, purpose. but and, and I think there are systems. System nothing. Which slide? Let's see, for instance, when we see one is connected to BA2. WC1 is connected to BA2, yes. And uh, GR2. The connection to the earth is to uh, an extra space. Yes. Okay. Yes. For instance, you have a kitchen. Yes. So, kitchen is connected. Should we also connect them to the GR1? 
No, it's it's. Yes. Uh, it's like since we have, we have to because this part is done as a not as an architectural thesis but as a mathematical thesis. So what we did is that we have to define adjacency in a very mathematical way. So the way we have defined adjacency, there are some particular definitions. Yes. So through those definitions only these are I'm not telling you the definitions what we have used, but we have introduced the definitions in a very general perspective because this is how mathematics. I think that's the problem when I defended my thesis. I have to defend it on a very abstract level. So that's why it's very mathematical. So it was very hard to convince uh, people from mathematics about this thesis. But since I get involved that much there, so when I came to architects, they were very specific. So they are looking for a very specific thing. And it's exactly opposite of what like I used to work or I used to think. So okay. <laughs> yeah, and about the it can be theoretically useful in the world used to be and uh, about this like reading of the graphs so we consider a lot of inputs we uh, like if you see that graph and if you have to see the shortest path so it's like you can see all pair of shortest path here so if you have to see like between br1 and gr1 so you should go to pr then ba2 then ba1 then gr2 and then gr1 and these are the distances between the each pair of the room so this is also done computationally through the graph so we can read the graphs and because through this prototype we can generate four million different solutions and if you see because in mathematics that matters and now the next question comes that how you compare two solutions so then again we introduce some mathematical theory to compare them so like the sum of the weighted distance so we calculate the distance and we can say that okay if we consider this floor plan it has some of the weightest distance minimum or this has the minimum area or this has the this thing so on the basis of these mathematical covariants then we compare the different solution so this prototype also computes a lot of these graph properties for no you have that's why i, I show you that uh, graphic user interface so you can keep changing the input and it keep uh, presenting the different solutions so by keep changing the input you can have four million different solutions for one input typical ways of reasoning in architecture is not finding out all the possible combinations and then choose one. It's usually setting out first all the constraints that the problem has. So it, it's shortening as much as, pro as possible the design space. Because the design space is really huge. Yeah. And, and the way um, architects used to do traditionally was essentially First of all, based on experience, so you would put immediately a lot of solutions uh, um, on the side and yes. start working on particular uh, uh, possibilities. And when we do it in a computational way, the tendency is always to check all the possible combinations and then clean. And I think there's a lot of waste in this process. Yes. <laughs> um, so probably and this brings again to the question of assumptions because we need to to to, to define a lot of assumptions uh, means that uh, we should have some some way of constraining things at the beginning in a very uh, hard form 
the biggest problem in, in, in this from the computational point of view is that architects uh, will say, well, the main constraints are this. And then they, you start getting results, and in the end they will say, no, the main constraints are not these, are other constraints. So it means that there must be some way of you know, getting results and coming back. This feedback uh, yeah. loop is particularly important. Um, usually, uh, in a, co a computational implementation, people tend to uh, forget these loops because they are difficult to implement. If we really want to have uh, useful tools, at least in design, any kind of design, we should keep uh, feedback loops somewhere in the process yeah. and as, as interactive as possible. One of the difficulties is to understand where we should have those loops. Okay. and how those, the loops should be implemented. Um, probably, and I, I, I have to say that uh, uh, the presentation which you made is very clear, it's very easy to follow all the steps and all the degrees of complexity, but that is very, very good. Uh, and I think that you developed a lot since the first presentation yeah. that you did, yeah. so that's also very good. But uh, there is a point where you need to consider all these uh, yeah. steps, you know. Uh, probably there's, there is still one step in complexity, one ahead, where you can uh, improve a few of the things related with the, the, the last things that I told you. But there, there must be a, a moment where you consider this, uh, uh, this topic of defining where the feedback would should. Yes. Should be how to define that feedback feedback loop, and probably relate that with those uh, um, layers uh, that, that you should have underneath the, the rectangular arrangement generation. <coughs> and I agree with you. Uh, the, you know, designers have not spoken not not to agree with you. As they say, when I, when I this is. Uh, authority. I said this is a good solution. Airport, they, they have they have no time, so they have to stop. <laughs> same, same, time. same time. But uh, I think you uh, have some uh, study heuristic methods. Heuristic methods. Yes. There are some uh, ways to uh, go back and forth. Yes. And try to uh, go quickly to the best. Oh well, to the best of the best. To go. Yeah. Yeah. No, like even when we did this work, and there was only because this was the problem we worked, and then there is one solution. And like in the last year of my thesis, we thought to develop this computer model, which is you know at the very initial stage. And when we developed this computer model, then we found very interesting thing because sometimes it happens that since it is giving so many solutions, that's okay. But it's still sometimes it happens that we cannot imagine everything. For example, it has 4 million solution. In this case, it has uh, extra space here and WC2 here. But if you see the next solution, maybe WC2 would be here or this extra space would go somewhere. So it's like we find it very interesting because we cannot visualize everything. And that's what computer can do when you write a code and it's something which you didn't expect and it comes out. So maybe it is not very useful, but it is interesting. And that's what mathematics do. We look for interesting things. No one knows that the mathematics has application or not. Someone found application something like but But it should be very interesting. Something new should keep coming and something like this. So that's why initially we developed this computer model. But then I thought that, yes, it can be really useful for architects. So let's move to architecture department and let's do something which is more relevant. But initially, it was not the idea to do something which should be. The idea is to do it in a more general way, which you can find applications in other fields also. It should not restrict to architect. But then I found my interest, and it is going like this. <laughs> I think we are starting in the, in the habits. I think that everyone 
just uh, experience that is repeating the same kind of uh, house or same kind of I don't know if we have it from our childhood memory or something, but we have some and that breaks all those kind of uh, habits. Yeah. Yeah, because we don't we would never think that way. You know, in in, in uh Architectural creativity, uh, and I, I will I will extend this to art in in, in, in general. Uh, certain approaches to creativity in the modernist era, because contemporary things tend to be a little bit more complex. But at least, uh, uh, so I would say until the 70s, uh, the approach would uh, toward would be to find a uh, personal style, personal language, uh, and it, it was a, 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 let's say, a, a very individualistic approach to art, in any artistic field. I will find my own way of expression, and that makes uh, the, uh, the need of, of the artist to create uh, a very strong view about the things that he or she wants to explore. And sometimes, might be uh, uh, a, a system of composition, so other times might be a use of the color, <coughs> other times might be a use of the matter, uh, uh, and in architecture it could be a material, uh, okay, a structural approach, a kind of a spatial approach, and it changes from architecture. And if you look at that with a lot of attention, you will see that there are very extreme cases of exploring these, uh, these approaches. These are the this is an extreme example of working with uh, um, uh, partitions which are basically rectangular walls that don't touch each other. They simply you know, subdivide, subdivide spaces and leave some spaces between each other that allow to, for things uh, to pass. So uh, it's a different uh, kind of, uh, 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 of approach. It's, it's very personal. Uh, and there are other examples, of course. But uh, it's always this, OK? So it means that, the, at least in modernism, the best artists, architectural or any other kind of art, uh, are people who define a lot of constraints to begin with. I'm just going to explore this. There's no other thing to see. My field of exploration is very tight and very uh, um, um, precise. And the fact that they define that is, uh, uh, is part of the generation of their own style, of their own quality. Uh, of course, there are functional issues and other things that we need to solve in the next part. Lecture, but still, they don't consider anything that is outside that space. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, the computational approach starts by, you know, simply ignoring this. Um, so, my question is would there be a way of developing tools that are allowed to have really valid <coughs> functions for? design exploration, especially when we have very complex problems to solve, but still allow the designer to have this kind of real world. Because in the end, any designer uh, will have will <coughs> otherwise they will ignore the issue because it doesn't yeah. have to do what uh, what it wants. Um, of course the contemporary situation is a little bit more complex because uh, designers tend to explore different languages every time they do a new project. And you can see that on a lot of projects. Some keep their own language in a very precise way, but others really try to explore different kind, kinds of approaches. For example, Grand Coors is very Obvious and also uh, effort and which are architects that really explore completely different approaches in the every design. But yeah. Yes. <laughs>
Yeah. So may I just start this again? Just one thing. Did you ever consider overlapping uh, on the same graph? Not the same graph, on the same uh, simple graph, which means the, the plan, the four plan. Did you ever consider making uh, different graphs and evaluating evaluating different uh, approaches? Either connectivity, visibility, uh, shorter path, uh, preferences, mm. and then evaluating them at the same time? No, I haven't. But yeah, this needs to be done because yeah, someone is good for something and someone is good for something. So till now my work is just concerned with this thing. But yeah, that's the one of the problem. Like some of the weighted shortest path should be minimum and yeah, these kind of the things, optimal thing. And yeah, one more thing is this I need to consider this overlapping also so that there won't be any void spaces. So many ideas are floating. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Great job. Thank you so much. So now, uh, for those who, who still have a little bit of time, uh, Camilla would like to, to present what uh, she's uh, looking into and uh, joining the session and giving us a glimpse of her work. Do you have the adapter? Yeah. Oh, can, can you use uh, your laptop? I have the what? I don't see a computer. Can Camilla present on your computer? Okay. Yes,
Okay, as all of you know, I'm a PhD student from the Politecnico di Milano, and my PhD work there is about uh, adaptive reuse strategy for office building, converting them into residential buildings. I jumped in shape grammars just during my last year of the PhD thesis, so I'm here trying to make an application of this methodology to the work that I've already done and that, and that I already done did before. So this presentation is divided into two parts. The first one where I will give you a brief uh, overview on my thesis work to make you understand the main objective of my thesis. And the second part is about what I developed here during the last month. So, uh, as I, some of you already know, uh, my thesis is to investigate the advantages of intervention on built environment rather than the application of demolition strategies. And the object of my thesis are the office buildings that are abandoned and not used and, uh, and tries to explore strategies of converting them into residential, um, particularly investigating on the strategy of the incremental facade that I will explain to you quickly later. And this addresses mainly to both public administration and public and private owners, investors in real estate field that uh, in order to show them and to make them understand the adaptive capacity to be reused of a building and also to figure out some strategy and application already effective to that purpose. So the research fields starts from this big gap that there is in the Milanese urban region because all my cases are from that area. It is the gap between a really great number of offices that are completely abandoned and not rent, and together with that, a huge demand for housing at an affordable cost, because all the new housing in the region of Milan has been just for very high standard of housing demands, while there is this big gap <coughs> and the strategy, the possible strategy of converting office can be an answer to this situation. Of course, not all the buildings that are now unused office will have a conversion to housing. Just in particular cases, this can be an affordable solution. One of the main aspects for which an office cannot be refurbished as an office is, for example, the obsolescence of the building for a particular, with respect to the new way of working, so the structure of some uh, existing building are not compliant anymore for a function that is an office function. Or for example, the energetic behavior of those buildings is not compliant anymore with the standard, um, high standard that are required in the millionaire's market for offices. And also there is a really exceeding number of office buildings with respect to the market request. There is an high vacancy rate with no perspective of short-term reabsorption of those buildings. And together with that, as we saw before, in high present uh, housing demand. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, that's right. In just in the, the data that I was showing before is just in the province of Milan. The request that that is an old data that I need to update, but for the period between 2006 and 2015, there was a request from 90,000 to 140,000 new dwellings. And also, not only the market of the owners and the Milanese people, but there is a huge market of people that just rent apartments so because everybody is really moving to Milan for different reasons mainly for working. So the structure of the thesis is divided in mainly into four parts. The first one was a data collection on all the urban regions so I made a chance to understand which were the buildings, how many buildings, in which location they were um, allocated and to understand maybe possible links between the location and the, topo the structure typology, the constructive typology of the building itself. 
then to make a benchmark um, considering uh, uh, similar cases of reuse of office building into housing and also benchmark of cases in which the main element of intervention was the facade. When I talk about facade, I'm not talking about a bidimensional surface, but I mean a surface that goes from 60 to 2 meters and 50 of depth that can be really useful for introducing in the building all those elements that are missing and that are necessary for an adaptation of the building. Then the third part was really focused on those elements, so on these um, incremental elements to be added to the building to make them work as residential building. And the last part is the application of the shape grammar methodology to the refurbishment of a case study. So very, I, these slides are in, are in Italian because I took some elements from previous presentation. It's just the, the map of Milan and some visualization of the um, buildings uh, um, that are <coughs> part of my chances. The buildings are a lot, the one that I'm taking in consideration, it's a sample of more or less 100 buildings that represents the general characteristics of all the available building stocks. There is a database with all the information on the buildings. And then I try to construct a matrix of linking the typology of the building, the day, the period of construction of the, build, of the buildings, together with constructive, uh, typological and functional uh, organization of those buildings. So I came out with different building types, mainly these seven categories, and each category can be uh, somehow uh, uh, represented in a schematic way in order to be representative of the whole group. And then each uh, category has a determinate uh, constructive typology and also linking the localization of those buildings with the city of Milan to understand, for example, in the city center there is a majority of buildings with a certain characteristic, on the borders we find other kinds of buildings and see if there is a link between the typology of the building and the localization in the city. The localization is important also for the conversion strategy because, for example, in the city center all the buildings can have um, a future as office building because it's so strategic being in the city center that also if the building is uh, not compliant with the most um, uh, the best the optimized uh, space plan for an office it works for a society being in the center outside the city this is not anymore the case <laughs> Then the second part, so it's an analysis of many buildings in which this incremental strategy has been used and some precise example in which they kept the structure of the building, demolished the inside, or in some cases they didn't demolish the inside and they just um, added the, the, the new incremental um, volumes, for example, giving external spaces to, to the office or adding an extra room or adding services like kitchen, bathrooms, and all those kinds of elements, and so on. So uh, why uh, adaptive reuse strategy with incremental? Of course, it's not the only way, it's the way that I'm exploring incremental surfaces as possible, as, as possible strategy of refurbishment, because somehow it helps in maximizing the effectiveness of the intervention, concentrating all the benefits of the refurbishment in the external without working too much in the internal, in particular from uh, the point of view of the introduction of plants, technical elements, and all the stuff. And more because working on the outside <coughs> gives four different main improvements and benefits, an aesthetical improvement of the building itself, and also a first uh, starting point of regen for regenerating urban context in which the buildings uh, are inserted, mm -hmm. then sp spatial and functional um, improvement because it helps in adapting the existing floor plan to the new function. Then structure because the majority of the building that I'm considering reaches the end of their life cycle. So they are almost 50 years old buildings and they need also <coughs> 
seismic uh, improvements and uh, so through the additional elements you can also provide a structural reinforcement of the existing building and then of course and it's one of the main aspects in this period in particular in Italy is uh, upgrading the energetical behavior of the buildings minimizing consumption and using also renewable energies the different also this the way is but how we locate the new addition on on the building and there are four main um, strategies the first one in reality is a subtraction so we we go inside the surface of the existing facade to add exterior uh, elements and this this subtraction as we will see later will make you gain some surface that you can locate in other places of the building then you can have single addition in specific points concentrated addition or diffuse addition all along the entire facade this uh, principle of the addition or better of the equipped facade already existed in many examples of the Milanese uh, historic architecture, modern architecture, because in, uh, in a specific period of the 90s, <laughs> many buildings uh, were conceived having the facade as elements for the technical uh, spaces such as kitchen and toilets, because they had also in a um, energetic, um, energetic behavior, the building creates a depth of distance between the bedrooms and the external. Now, uh, the second part is uh, starting from here, so from my mobility here. So I jumped in shape grammars and I thought that that could be uh, a good methodology to, um, for my purposes so for the adaptive refurbishment of buildings. In particular, I take shape grammars as an instrument for me to explore pre preliminary design hypotheses for the adaptive reviews of an office building into housing through the transformation of facade given a certain system of constraints and the boundary conditions that are both, both linked to the building itself and also to urbanistic regulation and so the urban context around the building and a certain set of design elements that are my incremental models. Uh, moreover, the idea is that as I show you before from the census, I, in, I found different types of buildings. So uh, the case study is, is on one of the types of the building that I'll show you later. And uh, uh, the idea of parameterize the dimension of the buildings and so to find an abstract schema that corresponds more or less to all the buildings of that category can allow to find a methodology and strategy that can be then applied to all the kind of refurbishment linked to that particular building schema. And also, um, once set out the methodology, can be uh, shape grammars can help in, so in finding out a sort of transformability capacity of the building itself. So to help public administration owners and et cetera, all the real estate investors to understand given a specific building is capacity of being adapted to um, residential reuse. So uh, the process that I'm trying to follow for is divided into four steps. The analysis step in which there is the analysis and comprehension of the building that I'm working on. And all of, oh, sorry, all of those steps have um, an, an output. So from the diagnosis aspect, the output is, is, can be summarized in representation. That is to say, finding different forms of description of the initial building in terms of morphological, functional, relational, structural, technological uh, characteristics of the building itself. Then the formulation process is the one that helps in the identification of the ideal transformation strategy for, for those schema, general scheme of building, trying and from the formulation process, the idea is coming out with a rehabilitation pattern, that is the, the identification of different levels of grammar um, that already take into consideration certain boundary conditions. Then the design process itself, that helps in the declination of the ideal rehabilitation pattern into the specific building I'm working in through the, 
definition of rule settings and different sequence of derivations of those rule settings. And finally, um, what I was talking about, a sort of evaluation phase in which finding out indicators of the capability of transformation of a specific reason. The case study I decided to work in on is this building because when I have just a few months for develop, so I will not develop a full grammar for uh, my, my, but it's more a methodological framework and then in the future work can be implemented. This building is a building um, together with the PhD I used to practice architecture in office. And the, one of the projects that I followed was the rehabilitation of an office building into housing. So it's a case, but I already worked on that. So I started to see from that building which were the, the rules we followed and try to figure out uh, the general strategy adopted and then try to make this strategy abstract and apply to the scheme of the building. So this was an office building, particularly in the city center. We made different proposals for the different floors. So dividing the floor some way on, on the lower floor, we had more apartments, five apartments for floor. Then going up, we had four apartments for floor. And then on the last floors, we had just two penthouses. So it was also for each floor plan. So I had already different kinds of floor plan um, already developed. This is one example. And so <coughs> I concentrated on the study of these three main floor, floor plan that we developed. In, in reality, there is one more plan for plan that I have to analyze that is with six dwelling for floor. So the main differences between the first two that they are both for with four dwellings for floor, but in one case we had the night zone at the corner of the building. And in the other case, so on those sides and we we'll see later. And in the other case we had the day zone on the corner. And just this difference is making uh, make me think rules for general generalize later the organization of the floor plan itself. And then there was the plan with five dwelling four floor. So first I I tried to figure out an abstract schema for this building. So there is the uh, the shape of the floor plan, floor plan and the shape of the core that is, is in this case exactly in the middle as many kinds of buildings of this category that is the tower building. Then I started to study the entry points. In uh, the first two cases directly from the core we had four entry points. In the last case where we had five dwellings for floor we have five, uh, five, four in this case in any case, there were five, I repeated three twice, but for five different entry points. Then I started to understand the circulation schema. The idea of circulation could have been all around the staircase, but in order not to waste space, we had just these um, additional spaces for circulation for entering inside the dwelling. And after the circulation schema, um, I figure out the, the division into dwelling for each floor. So in this first two case, four dwellings. In this other case, we um, divided the floor plan into five dwellings. This is not working, this scheme. I made it, but then I'll show you that it's not the correct representation. I tried to understand which was the internal circulation of the different dwellings, but those schemas are not really, I don't think, are correct representation of the organization, internal organization of the dwelling. And here is the representation of the division of each dwelling into night, day area, that is the green one, night area, that is the yellow one, and service area, that is the gray one. The interesting thing is that, as I was anticipated before, uh, between these two schemas, the difference is, in fact, the position of the day in the central area in the first case, and the day area um, on the corner side in the second case. Uh, in day area in Italy, we normally include uh, living, dining, and also kitchen, because kitchen is really linked to the everyday life, and often we are not having any more separate kitchen, but we are making new, while in the night area are all the bedrooms, and service areas are toilet, uh, closet, storage, and uh, bathrooms. Then after the day, uh, the zone division, I entered into the room division. <coughs> uh, 
so identified the different rooms, living, dining, kitchen, studio, single bedroom, double bedroom, working closet, and the service areas. And after that, in the real uh, practice, uh, we started introducing, a, a, as it was a building office, it doesn't have any external areas, so we introduced lodges just on the south facade. And then we saw that was necessary also, and we could, according to urbanistic rules, also extend all the building. And so we made oops, this extension all around, and was two meters all around the building. This um, theoretical extension then has been characterized with internal areas, external areas, and technical space. So what is in pink were internal areas that then we assigned to different uh, zone division, and what remains in gray were the balconies that were all added all around the building. So as you see, starting from the inside organization, the internal area in the addition where took the same function of the corresponding zone and also in the going on in the room division. So they became like the extension of initial minimal dimension of the room. In some cases, for example, in this one, this was a single bedroom. And the, thanks to the addition, you can, you, this apartment gained, for example, a double, two double bedrooms. And so in this, we use the extensions and the incremental surfaces just to extend already um, organized dwelling. So having studied this case, I figure out my abstract methodological schema for the shape grammar application. And in particular, I understood that I need for my purpose different levels of grammar. The first operation was defining the initial building because I wasn't interested in the demolition of all the internal partitions. So I decided to use as the initial building already the clean floor, floor, floor plan with structure and staircase. That was what we kept also in the practice for the building. Then the first level of grammar that I need to define is the definition of the division into dwelling that for me is one of the most interesting <coughs> elements also to understand the transformation capability of a building and also oriented to the market to understand that building, how many different uh, strategy of conversion can, can have. Then is the, the, the second level of grammar is the definition of the internal organization of dwelling. And the third level of grammar was, um, is, and will be in particular, the definition of the facade addition and the way of organized facade addition um, around the building. Because the aim, the final aim, uh, the final results that I'm looking for in reality is the definition of the facade grammar. So it's, uh, it's understanding um, the internal organization and the external um, addition that I will introduce which kind of facade grammar we generate for my building. So uh, it, those levels are not in a linear sequence, are all are open levels because they start from the, the first two, from an inside to outside approach, while the last one is starting from the outside to the inside because I saw during the analysis of the already done experience that the addition then simply took the function that was already given during the, the design phase, while starting from the external, gives different possibility of, of internal organization of the building itself. So uh, facade grammar will be the result of initial data that are both linked to boundary conditions that are external to the building, for example, urbanistic regulation, because to go out to the building, I need to follow the rules of the specific context, the orientation of the building, etc., together with the building data itself. <coughs> and between, and in this, um, in this case, to simplify uh, the results, the grammar, the facet grammar will be the combination of the results coming from both approaches. The facet grammar could also have combined together the, the two, the two, the two um, series of results. Okay, first step was so defining the initial building. Main, so starting from the initial existing flow floor plan, I took with, uh, I came out with an, 
an existing building simplified plan after the demolition and the scheme of that plan that considers the floor area, the core area and the orientation points. Then the idea is um, create a para parametrization of the building type in order because in other case I can have a bigger building with a bigger core and so if I find a way of making it an abstract and applicable to different situation case I can find a methodology that can be um, easily used for other buildings of the same kind. The initial building as I was saying before needs to be described in different ways. One way is the one that um, highlights the structural elements of the building. The other is the plan simply after the, demo the demolition. Then I need to figure out which are the different areas that are later labeled as usable area for the new dwelling, the stair areas, the elevators, and the circulation that is important then to understand the division into dwelling for each floor. And then in the last schema is the representation of the spatial relation between the core and the usable surface. This kind of representation were already used and experimented from Sarah Loy for her, during her PhD thesis that was about the refurbishment of Rabo de Bacayao building into new contemporary dwellings. So starting from the inside to outside approach, the first thing was defining entry points. And so um, in this case, according to uh, the dimension of the circulation area, it's possible maximum to have six entry points. Then starting from the entry points is find ways of figuring out circulation patterns that are strictly linked to the number of dwellings that we want to have on a single floor plan. As a matter of fact, if we uh, need um, bigger apartments, uh, we don't need to have much circulation because they can be all accessible directly from the staircase. If we need a bigger number of apartments of smaller dimension, in this case, we will have to add circulation. So this is the general framework. In parallel, um, I started developing already the grammar for that, but I'm not presenting it now, but I would like to discuss it with someone as soon as we can. So starting after the circulation schema, there is the important aim of defining the division into dwelling. For that, I, I decided to use two parameters, starting from the Milan regulations and also the last experience of new social housing in the city, the range of buildings that I saw and the typology that are requested by the market are from a minimum surface of 28 square meters to a maximum surface of, in reality, I move it to, one me to 140 meters, dividing dwelling from the studio flat to the three bedroom apartments. And also the minimal dimension of dwelling is linked to the orientation, for example, because on the north side you cannot have um, a bigger dwelling. And so I try to include all the constraints that were linked to the dimension of dwellings and the position of dwellings. And for example, simply uh, starting from one dwelling, I was trying to figure out the possible subdivisions and the implication of the subdivisions and then on the circulation patterns. Uh, second level is once that you define the dwellings for each floor, is starting with internal circulation schema. Uh, I was testing the simple scheme of the corridor circulation, but what I think that in reality is not the way in which contemporary dwellings are always organized. And so we, we should think also other kinds of circulation. But for this purpose, to simplify the three main uh, internal circulation I defined was the rear corridor, having the middle cor corridor parallel to the horizontal extension of the building, of the dwelling, and the middle corridor in a vertical position. And then I tried, I started um, giving parameters for that. For example, I know that the minimum weight for a corridor is one meter and 20. So if you know this dimension, then you know, because it's an existing building, the other dimension, so you can start creating rules um, that also are linked in a parametric way to the dimension of the building. 
After the circulation schema, there is the definition of the internal zone in day night zone and divided according to the different circulation schema can be organized in many different ways. And then the division into rooms. And also in this case, they, this data starts from the Milan construction regulation and the health and care regulation, national regulation. But it's important to have the minimum requirements by law and also the plus. In case we have more space, uh, this should be ideal dimension for having a more um, optimized floor plan. And then there are some constraints always linked to regulations in Italy. And so I tried with these two parameters, so with the zoning and the division into dwelling, to make a simplified derivation to see, for example, the different steps uh, that will help me in the formulation of specific rules for uh, adding surface, dividing surface, and starting from the day and night division into more detail schema that will uh, will bring to the final floor plan. Starting from the outside is uh, and going to to the inside is. It's the other operation that I would like to explore. First of all, where I find the uh, incremental surface, there are two different ways, two different main ways. The first one is the energetic bonus in Italy. That is to say, if you make energetic savings for the building, you can gain the 5% of additional surface that you can add all over the building. And for sure, as we are redoing completely the facade that the incremental or of energetic behavior will be sure after the intervention. So we gain this surface. And then you can uh, gain surface if you cut new lodges on the floor plan, that is surface that you can allocate in other places in order to add the function that you need. And so the, to but the total amount of additional incremental surface can be organized on the floor plan in many different ways. For example, you can divide the total amount uh, in equal way on all the floors, or you can say that the lower floor will not gain that surface and you will give the surface only in a crescent way or in a crescent way. So there can be many different patterns for allocating the surface that I really still need to develop more this part. So for example, if I go all around, and so I need to take into consideration for the outside to inside pattern two levels, the building level, so the total amount of surface along all the building, and also the dwelling level, so understanding uh, where, how to make interact the new surface with the future new, new dwelling. For example, just to make a simulation in this building, if I use all the surface that I need simply filling two floors, something that could be a possible operation, I will need just, for example, all built surface around two floors plus other 60 square meters to fill all the new surface. Or if I want to divide the surface from the floor three to the 11th, I can have 60 square meters for each floor that can be distributed in different ways. From a dwelling level, for example, one rule can be, for, um, can be linked to the position of the pillars. Because if we have an addition in a strange position with a pillar, for example, we cannot enter in the addition. So the two possible way of locating the new addition can be or between two pillars or having the pillar in the middle so that you can pass from both sides. For example, one, one possible rule for locating those, these surfaces. The other important rule that I'm not introduced is following the orientation because I will not go out on all facade in the same way because maybe on north side you can go um, out in a certain direction with a certain proportion while from the south you cannot in this specific building for example there was urbanistic rules per, um, that allows going out only on two of the four sides so for this case one of the constraints will be this urbanistic regulation and then also assign the function to this uh, location that can be of three types. Uh, one that are internal incremental spaces for the expansion of room surface for adding new kitchen or new bathroom. And the other can be external 
um, incremental areas for creating bioclimatic greenhouse, lodges, or balconies. And finally, can be also external addition to give technical, to provide technical space to the building that are, for example, a double skin facade, the, the, the addition of the insulation, the external insulation, or technical area for the passage of implementation ducts and that stuff. Developing these two approach, the idea is getting to the facade grammar that should derive from the combination of the two approaches in order to give you um, a, a quick feedback on the way in which the transformation that you propose on the floor plan will affect the general transformation of the building. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? The, the grammar already? No, now I don't. I can have something. I developed just the grammar for the um, division into dwelling of a floor plan, but uh, I have um, and drawn. One question from you. Uh, this last part of the grammar, that could be no no the idea is that that I imagine that this can can give indicators to a person that has a building so to test quickly with the, the dimension of the building if he wants to transform the building with uh, studios or with uh, two or three bedrooms apartments and also the constraints of the plants in terms of proportion of the plants how many dwellings uh, it's easy to locate so as if you develop it in a future parametric way you will you can have a software that's combining the data or the number of dwellings that you want to have and uh, uh, can give you different scenarios for the transformation of the dwelling in terms of feasibility. Uh, this can also provide so the indicator for the um, flexibility of a building to be converted into a specific kind of uh, function. No. Mm. Um, yeah, um, a few moments. Uh, first of all, I think the word is very, very interesting. Uh, and it's um, very well structured. Uh, so it has a lot of potential. Mm. I would say it's coming close to an end. <laughs> Still, I remember that I, uh, when I was doing my PhD in Delta, I saw a presentation exactly about um, yeah. the, the, some buildings uh, retrofitting, and one of the uh, strategies was extending the building towards the outside to make it uh, yeah. um, basically to enable the, the possibility of controlling the environment mm -hmm. in that way, and also um, that was uh, also a strategy for. Uh, uh, building um, uh, normalization in the sense that you would get a uh, higher value, uh, exactly. property value mm -hmm. out of uh, that information. Um, I think it was published, and I probably have something. Yes, I have many references from the F school on these yeah. studies. Yeah. Maybe I'll show you if it's the same kind of study. Okay. It's Remoy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I saw there were people from Dell in this uh, mm -hmm. presentation, but I saw it in a seminar in uh, Albania. Oh, okay. It was a uh, yeah. um, particular situation. Uh, I'll check if I have, because there was a publication on the same. Yeah. Um, uh, still, uh, Few comments. Uh, first comment is that the presentation which is very easy to follow, very nicely structured. So uh, we understand everything, no, no okay. doubt. Uh, and it's also very nice to, to see in the sense that the graphics are very, uh, uh, on one hand, standardized, so we can always understand the same 
things, uh, and they also look nice because the okay. colors are conscious. <laughs> Not just meaningful, yes. beautiful. <laughs> so all, all these are uh, I think the, of course this is the last part of the, uh, the work the development of the indicators. And I would say that uh, the main use of the indicators would be to really have an implementation of that uh, you do have uh, a real tool that would allow you to very easily test exactly. several solutions and mm. information to, uh, to the modules, and that's uh, very, uh, very useful, very interesting. Um, did you look into um, those um, ideas of, um, from the support theory from uh, um, John Abraham? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I, yes, I thought it was yeah. good to do it. <laughs> um, because there's, um, there's obviously a, a, a quite a, a good relation mm -hmm. with uh, you, you know, using the yes. bands, uh, As the bands the structure. The structure mm -hmm. the project. What do you keep all zones? Yes. Um, good. Uh, I, I would be just curious about how you would um, design the indicators. Because mm. uh, some are reasonably obvious, like uh, you know, the, the uh, amount of area that you gain, uh, what percentage of that you gain. Um, but then there are other issues like uh, the cost of intervention. Um, and, um, yeah, I don't have much more to say. Thanks, Sheila. One, one thing I have to say is that. Uh, um, I have a lot of stuff to do, and, and uh, uh, I hope these presentations, these meetings are really important because this is, these are the moments where we all learn a lot. And uh, every time we do a presentation um, on, on, on these kind of meetings, everyone you know, gets some information that will be there and be all who wants to present is just come and present yeah. This discussion being too good about yeah. Yes. Uh, the only time this was to be this was to be fun to do but uh yeah. <laughs> Lately we we slowed down for <laughs> several reasons. But still I uh, yeah, I agree that it's good. Um uh, <coughs> one comment, not exactly for the new but uh, <laughs> Uh, because some of the examples that have been in the show uh, actually can give you um, uh, some ideas on what I was uh, talking about. And if you organize the self organization has some supports to uh, This is one thing. But also, the first, um, the first plans, can you get back to the first plans that you showed about the, the first uh, design that you took as example? The last one, this. The first one. It's actually the first plan to show. Yeah. This. Ah. Yeah. Uh, this. Uh, this uh, three points, uh, which correspond to the three levels. Yes. Um, they actually respect all those uh, those aspects that I told you about when I was saying about having a kind of a mm. um, layer. And that the structure, not just its, the, 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 the structural matrix, but also the composition of matrix. You have both of these there. And it's very, very clear. Okay? Uh, you immediately spot an order and I tell you, you know, can you uh, tell me where the structure is? Can you tell me where the compositional rules are? Can you read them? It's very uh, usually, without a project, project has that quality. 
this uh, immediately kind of jumps uh, to your eyes. Um, so this is something that uh, architects always uh, try to you know, define as a first layer of uh, constraint. Um, so try to figure out if there is any way, you know, of uh, setting up the system in a way that you can have this layer uh, order. I mean, because it really brings uh, influence out of it. Can I ask you <laughs> something? Because as now um, Professor Duarte was following me in this uh, development and now is not anymore uh, very close so I don't think we'll have many occasion of comparing with it. I really don't know how because I developed just the first part of grammar about the um, division into dwelling of the floor plan but I would like really to to show to somebody to discuss a little also because this is the general framework and I don't think that in my case the main idea is really developing all the levels of grammar, but was more a general overview. And maybe the most interesting part can be figuring out uh, indicators that are, this is the last chapter of my thesis that can be really like the future work to be done. Um, but uh, still, I, I would need to, to speak with somebody. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, we can start with a conversation on this. Uh, what I would say is that uh, you, First, bring me all the information that you have in terms of the yes, because... of, of the grammar. In any case, uh, during the presentation, it's very easy to understand that there is already some grammar. Yes, there. that's okay. the thing that Professor yeah. Duarte told me, and I tried for one for the division into dwelling. That for me is very crucial to do it but i would like to show and discuss about that because doing really and the, for me the difficult was also trying to um, to to find mathematical way also of setting boundary condition and also the graphs that helps in understanding mm -hmm. because i would like to find like a generic way of really uh, creating the floor the floor plan i mean in particular the division into dwelling i don't mind organizing inside the dwelling because it would focus more than on the additional element parts but just to to have a talk about that uh, and the first yeah. rules that i tried to sketch could be yeah. when uh, i don't know if to you or to professor romao to have somebody yeah, I mean, you can also talk to professor. Hmm. still um the, the the main thing is first you divide it in, in those different levels yes. of uh, grammars. I think that makes all the sense. Mm -hmm. it's, for me, it's absolutely correct. Um, then um, there was a moment in some slide that I thought about that the, some of the order was. Being lost in, at, at a certain step, mm -hmm. then somehow you recover that uh, order. Maybe you know, by checking all the rules, yeah. you can see if there's some step that could be improved. But uh, the main idea is that was to have these four levels and to identify the rules of the, uh, uh, of the grammar of the several levels. Uh, the first level is probably the least yeah. to find. Definition. The second level is uh, is not the most important for yeah. your goal, but it's the most difficult one. And the only thing that is important in that level is that it constrains the, uh, uh, the, the, the facade definition. Yeah. Um, so uh, I would say that. Basically, uh, to solve the, the second level, uh, following some of the solutions that Sarilai developed mm. for grammar is probably the correct mm. approach. But any, in any case, the, the, the 
department structure of the technology that will come to the technologies is a, a, a bit more complicated. Yes, because the old internal part yeah. that you cannot demolish. So in my case, it's completely different because it's more like doing a completely brand new design. I have less constraints than, that, yeah. than in that case. Also, by following the zone logic uh, mm. from uh, other, and probably it makes it a lot easier to mm. find the, the, yeah. uh, the, basically the topology. Mm. Okay. Uh, because uh, uh, what Sarah used to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, control the, um, uh, the housing program uh, is basically the black. Yeah. The graph establishes exactly. the relations and it keeps the program in a logical mm -hmm. way. Uh, as soon as you have uh, the zone uh, system, you already have some embedded order in that. Yeah. Uh, and it makes it easier to control the graph, but it, it can be approached in more or less the same way. Yeah, but we can check that. Okay. That's the, the more the most complex part of the of the grammar, but it also has this uh, funny thing: is the most complex, but it's the less important. Part. Yeah. <laughs> uh, still, it gets some information in terms of the let's say the cost of the intervention. So mm. It's more some information in terms of the extent of the intervention. Amount of construction effort. Exactly. Um, and when you at the end evaluate uh, with some indicators, I would say that a few of the indicators will have to do some attention on, on this topic of construction effort. Yes, that's for sure. Yeah. But the most important thing to actually really have uh, a tool that very easily would help you, you know, give exactly. this information to, uh, to the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. That's a strong uh, mm -hmm. and development of and gives you a competitive advantage. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, in the beginning, Thank I was about the regulation of the municipality. Mm -hmm. How can you increase the, the square footage of the building so much? Because just by yeah. going a little bit further out of the, of the original design, mm -hmm. you're already giving so much area to the yeah. square footage. So how can you do it there? How is it possible? So then you already mm -hmm. replied with the, these models yes. of the Energetic behavior. Yeah. So basically, you're proposing uh, speculation. No, no, no. Because we need to solve it. Like, uh, first of all, you're taking a better job of the models, and then you, with the solution, you provide the, the, the reason to it. And um, I don't know if you're one of the characteristics of the project slash grammar in the end. Will be to evaluate how much the gain in the energetic efficiency is going to be a lot. Uh. And we are really calculating that now. I would what I'm doing, what I did with the benchmark, and I will um, systemize is um, that uh, I found data of similar intervention done uh, in other countries, in European countries. So I have the values of certain kind of intervention in terms of energetic behavior. So what I can um, introduce in the indicator is already uh, what uh, were the benefits uh, in other um, building already realized that were after there is a very nice program in Germany that follows, monitors the building after the energetic behavior intervention for a certain period. That, that is optimized building, uh, if you want, I can give you the link. And so with those data, I can know if I made, for example, an external insulation, if I expand the facade using a particular technology, which will be the benefits in terms, which were in those cases. You can simulate yeah. After we grab the solution, you can always send it to an evaluation. 
Yes. And uh, we'd rather we can also maybe one of the interesting things is to make it uh, provide a universal possible solutions and then uh, just evaluate. In uh, terms of energetic behavior. Uh, okay, this would give uh, uh, higher rents. Uh, this is, uh, no, in uh, fact, the idea of understanding the different scenarios of transformation yeah. of the building is to evaluate also from an investor point of view uh, the scenarios. And also, it depends, for example, in this real practice case, we started with this investor, then the project never, never really started because of financing bank problems uh, and as usual but that uh, kind of um, uh, stakeholder needed specific targets of dwelling so we prepare for in those dwelling then after four years uh, we saw that another office got that project it was another stakeholder that really took the building and the program was completely different so it's also that with the same building you can propose if for example it's a public building a municipality that the problem is that it's an abandoned building that is just a cost in terms of also um, contexts that are not anymore that are not uh, uh, well preserved in terms of energetic behavior and all the stuff. A municipality can propose the same building to different kind of stakeholders because can evaluate previously quickly the different scenarios that uh, um, that for a stakeholder uh, implies different business plans uh, for really taking uh, the building and developing the strategy of conversion. Um. Hmm. Picking up on what we were saying uh, about um, the regulations that probably the Portuguese regulations wouldn't allow these type of extensions to exclude. Uh, I think that this simply shows that uh, the Italians as well as the Dutch are obviously. Uh, Further again, that's true. But um, um, there is a reasonable, uh, uh, it is reasonably uh, accepted uh, already that uh, uh, transformations on the facade can really transform the, 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 the building behavior. Yeah. And so, uh, interventions that consider only the inner uh, and, uh, spaces of the building are um, less uh, liable to produce good results in terms of uh, energetic exactly. behavior yeah. of the building, uh, while uh, reasonably simple or technologically simple interventions just considering the skin of the building uh, will, will create a lot, a lot of benefit. So, uh, if you can have this tool also as a measurement tool, it can provide real, uh, uh, reliable information on this, uh, on this kind of topics uh, uh, towards a uh, municipality. I would say that uh, our, our law has a typical problem with this over constraint in many aspects. Mm. We I mean, always need to decide on what are the laws that you are not going to fulfill. Uh, okay, this happens in every project, and as soon as this is true, it means that you can actually choose the laws that you are not going to comply. With. And you simply need to um, um, <laughs> explain in every detail why you don't do it. Okay, so sometimes you can have uh, uh, enough information to actually start with uh, some uh, design problem with some stakeholder that is willing to take the risk and start with the negotiation process uh, 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 with the municipality. And this is possible. Okay. Yeah, uh, let's not be saying we are not going to comply with that. Yeah. <laughs> but showing evidence okay, that there is yes. an advantage if you do not do it. Uh, laws are not necessarily correct. Laws are there because at a certain point somebody made them up uh, based on some criteria. 
and even the criteria that was used at in the that time might have changed. That's true. And, and that's enough to make a law that was wide at a certain point become yeah. uh, obsolete at a certain point. There are always laws that are obsolete, uh, and we have to cope with that. And make creating evidence that they are not correct uh, is providing opportunities for change. And, and people will start accepting accept the exceptions on the basis of evidence. And even, you know, uh, um, simply um, delete the law. Yes, change, change the law. It happens. Yes, it happens. Constantly, uh, the, uh, I would say that actually the real evolution of the law is the deleting process and not the, the, um, the addition the, the process. Addition. Because the addition tends to over constraint and create mm. problems, and delete tends to freedom and, and options. And opportunities. And, yeah, and if goals are still kept as. Uh, Target mm. issues uh, is uh, it's the most important. Yeah. That, that also has something to do with the practice of the law. There are some countries that are able with that practice to keep the spirit of the law more than the really the strict really respect. Strict Anyway, uh, I think that's, um, that's also a change. Mm. There was, uh, uh, at a certain point during the last conversation, I remember that there was one statement at the beginning of the presentation that I really didn't agree with. Okay. And that was when we were talking about um, you know, the, the buildings in the center have all the potential to be uh, recovered to, 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 office uh, to offices. Somehow that is true, but that's also the implication that, okay, outside everything has to be residential. Right. And there are also some defining issues in terms of, uh, 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 and now I'm speaking on a, a yeah. planning schedule, <laughs> which is another thing. And uh, it should be always part of the regional scale, especially because the region of the island is yes, really huge. rich and very dispersed. Yes. So it, it, it means that uh, uh, in, in that region, the planning needs to understand uh, where are certain spots to create new centers and intensify those centers. Um, Especially if uh, a city with more than uh, one million inhabitants, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that the city has a metropolitan area. Exactly. Um, uh, from uh, one million inhabitants above, it needs to be uh, um, polycentric. Otherwise, Milan is already polycentric. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, in, in, in the case of Milan, the policy yeah. strategy. It's clearly uh, something that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not as necessary or exactly no. as you said, although, yeah, there is some. No, I was saying, yes, in terms of. In that, in those cases, you can evaluate if keeping the office or converting anyway into residential, while other buildings for sure will not have any future as offices. In those cases, one possibility can be also keeping the function of office, also if the building is not compliant with the most uh, common requirements for offices. That is also the mixed use. The mixed used. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. No, so thank you everyone for attending this uh, this UG lecture. Uh, as uh, we have been uh, uh, Sending the information to everyone in the list, uh, the video of this session is available in, uh, in the DCG Hangouts. 
and uh, well, hope to hear more from you and uh, looking for future sessions. Thank you.